Recording by Joe Morris. Join Our Gang by Sterling E. Lanier. Fancy Capital C Commander William Powers, subleader of the Survey Group Syrian Combine, 1027798, and hence first officer of its ship, the Benefactor, stared coldly out of his cabin port. The Benefactor was resting on the bedrock of Island 27 of the world called Mures by its natives. Like all other such names, it meant the world, just as the natives' name for themselves, Falsetha, meant the people, or us, or the only race. To Commander Powers, 50 years old, with 11 of them in survey work, the world was a planet too of a star called something unpronounceable and the nebula of something else equally pointless. He had not bothered to learn the native name of Island 27 because a ship had mapped 1,386 islands, all small and either rocky or swampy or both. Island 27, to him, had only one importance, and that was its being the site of the largest city on the planet. Around the island's seven square miles, a maze of docks, buildings, sheds, breakwaters, and artificial inlets made a maze stretching a mile out to the sea in every direction. The gray sea, now covered with fog patches, rolled on the horizon under low-lying cloud. Numerous craft, some small, some large, moved busily about on the water, which in its components was identical with that of Terra, far distant in the Sirius sector. Crude but workable atomic motors powered most of them, and there was a high proportion of submarines. Powers thought of Earth's oceans for a moment, but then dismissed the thought. Biological technical data were no specialty he needed. Terra might be suitable for the action formulating in his mind, but a thousand suns of Syrian combine might prove more useful. The biologist of Grand Base would determine, assisted by data his ship provided, in their monster computers what was called for. Powers had been trained for different purposes. He was, as every survey commander was, a battle-hardened warrior. He had fought in two major fleet actions in his day, and had once, as a very junior ensign of the Syrian Grand Fleet, participated in the ultimate horror the destruction by obliteration of an inhabited planet. For planetary destruction, a unanimous vote of the Syrian Grand Council, representing over 4,000 worlds, was necessary. It had been given only four times in the long history of the Confederacy. Every intelligent being in the Grand Union shuddered the thought of its ever becoming necessary again. Power stared moodily over the rocky ground toward a group of figures in the distance which were moving in his direction. The final delegation of the Murist government, a world government, was coming for its last meeting before the benefactor departed into the far reaches of space. Powers braced himself mentally for a grand effort. He held equivalent rank to that of a galactic admiral, and it was held for one reason only, because of his real work and its importance. He was a super psychologist, a trend analyzer, a salesman, a promoter, a viewer, an expert on alien symbology, and the spearhead of the most ruthless intelligence service in the known universe. Long ago, he had transferred from the battle fleet to the inner school at Sirius Prime for the most intensive training ever devised. Now it would be put to the ultimate test. He heard the airlock open and turned away from the window. He had a long way to walk to the neutral council chamber, for the benefactor was a big ship, despite the fact that only 20 beings comprised the total complement. Down the echoing corridor as he paced, brow furrowed in thought. Mazachaz would have his own ideas, he knew, but if they made no impression, he would have to put his oar in. Each being on board, whether he breathed halogen or oxygen, ate uranium or protein, had to be independent in thought and action under certain circumstances. The circumstances were here, here and now, in his judgment. He arrived at the door of the council chamber and entered, an impressive sight in flaming orange and blue uniform. Four members of the Supreme Council of the Muris rose slowly and inclined their heads in his direction. 
They were tall bipeds of vaguely reptilian ancestry, most of their height being body. They stood on short, powerful legs, terminating in flippered feet, and their long arms were flanged to the second elbow with a rubbery fin. Only four opposed fingers flexed the hands, but the dome-shaped heads and the golden eyes screamed intelligence as loudly as the bodies shouted adaptation to an aquatic environment. Around the brown torsos, light but efficient harness supported a variety of instruments in non-corrosive metal sheaths. All of the instruments had been discreetly examined by scanning beams and pronounced harmless before any contact had been allowed. Across the central table, Sok Mazachaz of Lyra 8, leader and captain of the survey, stared red-eyed at his executive officer. Mazachaz resembled the delegation far more than he did his own officer, for he too had remotely reptilian forebears. Indeed, he still sported a flexible tail and, save for his own orange and blue uniform, ablaze with precious stones, resembled nothing so much as a giant terrestrial chameleon. The uniforms were no accident. Survey men wore anything or nothing as the case called for it, and Falsetha admired bright colors, having few of their own and a good color sense. The gleaming jewels on Massachusetts' uniform stressed his superiority and rank to powers, as they were meant to. Of the 20 survey men on board the Benefactor, Massachusetts and Powers were the only two who most resembled, in that order, the oxygen-breathing natives of Maurice. That automatically made them captain and executive officer of the Benefactor. The native population saw only the captain and executive officer of the ship, and only the council chamber. On a world of ammonia breathers, Mazachaz and Powers would have been invisible in their own part of the ship, providing advice only to the Skorgak of Marga, Ten, Lambdim, and perhaps Nayur of Antares by Twelve. If a suspicious native saw an entity with whom he could feel a remote relationship giving orders to a weird-looking, far more alien creature, a feeling of confidence might appear. Since Majachaz came from a planet of superheated desert and scrub resembling the Karoo of South Africa, the resemblance could have been bettered, but it was well within the allowable limits set forth in the inner A mandate. And in galactic psychology, every trick counted. For persuasion was the chief weapon of the Syrian Combine. Outright force was absolutely forbidden, save by the aforesaid vote of the Council. Every weapon in the Book of Persuasion was used to bring intelligent races into the Combine, and persuasion is a thing of infinite variety. As these thoughts flashed through Power's mind, he seated himself in a plain chair and adjusted the universal speaker to his mouth. Beside him, on a more elaborate chair, tailored to fit his tail, Mazachaz did the same, while the four Falsitha seated themselves on low stools and took similar instruments from the oblong table which separated them from the two surveymen. Deep in the bowels of the ship, a giant translator switched on to simultaneously translate and record the mutually alien tongues as they were spoken. Adjustable extensions on the speakers brought the sound to the bone of the skull. For different life forms, different instruments would have been necessary and were provided for. Mazachaz, as captain, opened the proceedings. Since this is our last session with you, we hope some fresh proposals have occurred to your honorable council during your absence, hummed the speaker through Power's skull. He who is designated first among the council of the Muries answered, We have no new proposals, nor indeed had we ever any. Trade would be welcome, but we vitally need nothing from you or your combine have described, Captain. We have all the minerals we need, and the Great Mother, he meant the sea, provides food. We will soon go into space ourselves and meet as equals with you. We can cannot tolerate what you call an observer, who seems to us a spy, and not subject to our laws by your own definition. That is all we have to say. That does it, thought Powers glumly. The cold... An entirely accurate description of the planetary representative of the Syrian Combine was the final clincher. The intensely proud and chauvinistic Falisthesa would tolerate no interference. Mazachaz gave no indication he had heard. He tried again. In addition to trade and education, 
General advancement of the populace, murmured the Mike. Have you considered defense? He paused. Not all races who travel in space are friendly. A few are starkly inimical, hating all other forms of life. Could you defend yourselves, honorable sirs, against such? It was obvious from the speed of the answer that the Council of the Muris had considered, if not anticipated, this question. The second member spoke, an obvious pre-assignment. In all our long history, you are our first contact with star travelers. Yet we are not defenseless. The Great Mother contains not only food, fish, and plants which we harvest, but many strong and terrible beasts. Very few are left to disturb us. In addition, the implications of your ship have not escaped us and our scientists are even now adapting some of our atomic devices used in mining to other ends. The voice contained a faint hint of pride as it ended. We got guns too, buddy, it said, and we ain't pushovers. The first of the council spoke again. Let me be plain, respected starfarers. It seems obvious to us that you have learned most of what we represent as a council, if not all. We are the heads of the great clans, and we will not change. It hardly seems likely that you represent a society based on heredity if you include the diverse and nameless breeds of creature you have shown us in your screens. We do not want such an amalgam on our world, causing unrest and disturbances of public order. Still less do we desire authoritarian interference with the ordered life we have developed. Your requests are won and severally refused. There will be no observer. Trade regulated by us, would be welcome. Otherwise, should you choose not to be bound by our laws, we must respectfully and finally bid you farewell. When at some future date we develop ships such as yours, we may reconsider. The speaker paused, looked at his three confreres, who nodded silently. The first stared arrogantly at Mazachaz and continued. Finally, we have decided to place a ban on further landings by aliens unless you are now prepared to negotiate a trade agreement on our terms. Powers thought frantically, his face motionless. This was defeat, stark and unequivocal. The parable he had in mind seemed indicated now or never. He turned to Sak Mazajaz and spoke. May I have your permission to address the honored council, noble captain? He asked. Speak, first officer, said the Lyran whose gular pouch is throbbing. His ruby eyes, to his associate, looked pained as well they might. Let me pose a question, honored sirs, said Powers. Suppose that in your early history of creating your orderly realm, you had discovered on one of your islands a race of falsefa, as advanced and regulated as yourselves, who wished nothing to do with you. He could feel the alert attention of the four as the golden eyes glowed at him. The implications of your question are obvious, the first of the council spoke, as coldly as ever. Do you threaten us with force from your combine devoted to peace? The flat voice of the translator hummed with acquired and impossible violence, which powers knew to be subjective. The first continued. We would resist to the ultimate, down to the least of our young and the most helpless female weed cultivator. Do your worst. Power sat back. He had done his best. The hereditary dictatorship of a united world had spoken. No democratic minority had ever raised its head here. The society of Maurice was stratified in a way ancient India never thought of being, down to refuse collectors of a thousand generations of dishonorable standing. Ancient Japan had been as rigidly exclusionist, but there had been a progressive element there. Here there was nothing. Nothing, that is, except a united world of coldly calculating and very advanced entities about to erupt into space with heaven knew what weapons and a murderous arrogance and race pride to bolster them. He thought of the dead orb called Sibelia, rolling around its worthless sun, an object of nausea to all life. And he had helped. Well, the boys in biology had the ball now. He forced himself to listen to the first of the council as he bade Magitaz a courteous farewell. Depart in harmony and peace, honorable starfarers. May your great mother be benign when you return to give your high council our message on the far distant worlds you have shown us in the sky. The council departed, 
leaving Powers and Mazachez staring at each other in the council chamber, their gaudy uniforms looking a little dull and drab. Well, Sack, said Powers, his ruddy face a little flushed. We can't be perfect. They don't know about space warps and instantaneous communicators. Plan 2 has nothing to do with us. Beyond our recommendation, you mean, said the Lyran flatly. We have failed, William. This means death for thousands of innocent beings, perhaps more. Their world population is about 80 million, you know. There was silence in the room until Powers broke it again. Would you have Sibelia sack? He asked gently, or Ruler One, Belavan's world, or Labath? There was no answer to this, and he knew it. There was only one alternative to a dead, burned out, empty planet. Miris was in the wrong stage of development and would have to be brought in line. The Syrian Combine had to and would remove any intelligent, unknown menace from a position from which it could threaten its master plan of integrated peace. As they left the chamber, Powers said a silent prayer and touched the tiny crescent and star embroidered on his shirt pocket. At least, he thought, the planted ultrawave communicators would be there when the Falsetha needed them. He looked out of a corridor port, the gray and rolling sea. A great mother, he thought bitterly, benevolent and overflowing. Traleres 124, female gardener, age 32 cycles, hummed in a minor key as she harvested weed of the solstice crop 12 miles off the northern islands. A rest period was due in the next cycle day, and she and her mate were ahead of quota, which should make the supervisor give them a good holiday. The tall weeds swayed gently against her, and several small fish darted past in fright. As the first heavy beat of the water struck against her slim body, she looked up. Frozen with horror, she realized her container, but in 40 feet, of water the monster caught her before she had moved a hundred yards. As it fed, horribly, other grim shapes, attracted by the blood, moved in from the distant murk of deeper water. Sabathic Air rode his one-man torpedo alertly as he probed the southern bay of Ramasaret. He was a scientist twelve and also a hereditary hunter. If the giant fish long since eliminated from the rest of the seas, were breeding in some secret area of the far and desolate southern rocks. It was his business to know it. No fish could catch his high-powered torpedo, while his electric spears packed a lethal jolt. Probably, he thought, a rumor of the poor fisher folk who worked at the southern fringe areas. What else could you expect from such types, who had never even learned to read in a thousand cycles? Nevertheless, as he patrolled the sunken rocks, he was alert, scanning the water on all sides constantly for the great shape he sought, his skin alert for the first strange vibration. By neglecting the broken bottom, brown with laminaria and kelp, he missed the great mottled tentacle which plucked him off his torpedo in a flash of movement, leaving the riderless craft to cruise aimlessly away into the distance. Your Highness, said the Supervisor Supreme, we are helpless. We have never used metal nets because we have never had to. Our fiber nets, they slash to ribbons. They attack every species of food fish from the ursa to the crod. The breeding rate is fantastic. And now my equal who controls the mine says they're attacking the miners despite all the protection he can give them. They are not large, but in millions. Seize your outcries, said the first in council wearily and remove that animal from my writing desk. I have seen many pictures of it since they first appeared five cycles ago. It still looks alien and repulsive. They stared in silence at the shape that any high school biology student of distant Terra could have identified in his sleep. At length, the first in council dismissed the supervisor of fisheries and headed thoughtfully for an inner room of his palace. He knew at the last meeting of the strange metal communicating devices, discovered and confiscated after the starship had departed six cycles before. It was a simple machine to operate, and he guessed food could be sent incredibly quickly to his starving planet. Just as quickly as other things, he thought it grimly. And we have to beg. Huh. Admission to the great peace-loving combine. May the crabs devour them. But he knew that he would send, and that they would come. 
I was comparing the two reports, my friend, said Mazachaz, but I am not so familiar with your planetary ecology as I should be. When Maurice applied for admission to the Combine, I requested a copy of their secret directive from biology, but I had never seen the older report until you gave it to me just now. Can you explain the names to me if I read them off? Go ahead, said Powers, sipping his sherbet noisily. He seldom wondered what alcohol would feel like any longer. Most old believers had tried it when young and disliked it. I've already looked up the names I didn't know, he said, to start the Mauricean list first. Great white shark or man-eater, read Mazachez. He sounds obvious and nasty. He is, says Powers. He put down his glass. Remember, as usual, the birth rate has been at least tripled. An increased metabolism means increased food consumption, and no shark on Terra was ever full. This brute runs 40 feet when allowed, in size that is. A giant carnivorous fish, very tough. Number two is Archetulithus, or giant squid. Is that a fish? Sorry, but on my world, well, fish are curiosities. It's an eyed carnivorous mollusk with enormous arms, 10 of them, and it reaches 80 feet long at least. It swims well too. There was a moment of silence, and Mazuchaz continued. Smooth dogfish. A tiny shark, said Powers, about three and a half feet in size. They school in thousands on Terra and eat anything that swims. Just blind, agile appetite. They have a high normal breeding rate. Finally, we have a Balaran salamander, so you're free of one curse anyway. Balera, I believe, is hellishly wet, although I don't know much about it. Powers rose and stretched. He's a little fellow with six legs and a leathery hide, a nuisance on Valera, which is the equivalent of a Terran swamp. He eats every vegetable known, dry or fresh, and, being only two inches long, is hard to see. He doesn't bite, just eats things and breeds. There must be millions of now, on each island of Maurice. Then the eggs get carried about. They're tough and adhesive. You can guess what their warehouses look like. At least two million starved before the council gave in, resumed the Liren sadly but they gave in all the way and abolished caste privilege before the first relief ship even arrived. They'll be full members shortly. And this older report? Read the name, said Powers. He was staring out of the club window at the stars. They fed us our own dirt because we hadn't eliminated all of our competitors. Disease means like microorganisms, so you choose the largest animal possible with efficiency, that is. Just read the list. My grandparents died, you know, but it had to be done, or we'd have destroyed ourselves. The combine was a far greater blessing to us than it ever was to Maurice, I can assure you of that. He listened in silence as the leer and read. Desmodus, the vampire bat. Ratus norvegicus, the common rat. Mus domesticus, the common mouse. The common locust. Zivilagus, the cottontail rabbit. Passer Domesticus, the house sparrow. Sternus vulgaris, the European starling. Power sat down and stared at his friend. Terran life, by comparison with many other worlds, is terribly tough because we have so many different environments, I suppose. Hence its use on the Muris. Of course, the combine increased breeding rates again, but adapting that bat to stand cold is the last straw, he said. The rest of them were all ready and waiting, but the bat was tropical. We'll start without him. Desmodus is a small flying mammal about the end. End of Join Our Gang by Sterling E. Lanier. Recording by Joe Morris, Oakland, California. My website is xenotropic.net, X-E-N-O-T-R-O-P-I-C.net.